the people that I find myself most attracted to to spend my time outside of work are people that are comfortable in their own skin. I don't have to surround myself by other entrepreneurs. I don't have to surround myself by successful people. I just want to surround myself by happy people. And that kind of layers into the the part that's frustrating with the question before is the the path to happiness is usually right in front of you. But it's just are you going to take action to get there or not? And that's the part that frustrates me is, is people's inability to get uncomfortable to solve their problems. Instead, they just like kick the can down the road and deal with these things forever. You're listening to another episode of Success with Purpose, where we hold conversations with the most holistically successful people we have the opportunity to connect with. We explore their journeys, their life-changing events, their perspectives, their mindset, and most importantly, their purpose. I'm Harry Goldberg, host, interviewer, and interrogator of this podcast, father of the most incredible daughter in the world, husband of an incredible woman, and director and empowerment coach at Purpose Advisory. Hope you enjoy this episode, and don't forget to subscribe and like below. Now, let's begin. Damon, welcome. What's up, Harry? Yeah, awesome to have you here. Uh, so just to give the listeners a bit of an idea of who you are, basically you started out in data management, you moved on to radio for a few years, and then started your own SEO company before GFC. And so since then, you've seen massive growth in that company as well as a whole bunch of others which you manage as well. You built out your team and from our chats, it kind of seems like you're just getting started and that's really exciting to see as well. You're a Forbes council member. You've represented some exceptionally impressive businesses through your SEO business. And on top of that, you're a really proud family man. And sorry, I almost forgot. Most importantly, <laughs> you have a really impressive beard. <laughs> yeah. Well, that is all very factual except for the beard part is it's um, not as sexy as it looks on this beautiful camera. <laughs> and it's very, it's very patchy in real life. <laughs> <laughs> See, some uh, people won't watch this video. They're just going to yeah. end up okay, listening yes, to Yes, amazing voices. beard then. Absolutely the best beard ever. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I mean, it's um, it's been a fun journey, and it's it's interesting, like you said, kind of at the end, where it, it seems like it's just beginning. Which um, you know, we'll probably get into that as we we go through this. But yeah, I started um, the side hustle kind of thing, and uh, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. So maybe I'll, I'll give you the condensed version, and then we can circle back where you want. But um, started the side hustle, realized the opportunity in it, made the leap of faith. Um, and then I want to go over the kind of phases I think that I went through in my journey, because I think that helps a lot of other people um, because we mm. all see the success of other people and then we, we get excited. And then there's the downside of that where, where you kind of beat yourself up and say, I want to be in, in that place, but I'll kind of walk through how um, I interpret growing a company and going through those phases and how I was not in a rush. But yeah, it's been cool to do things the way that I felt were most appropriate for me. And it's turned out to where I've built a lifestyle around the things that make me happy. And then I still have all those, you know, I, I think a lot of times we, we get obsessed um, with the financial wins and stuff like that. So I have all those things there, but those are the things that when, once you achieve, uh, however you define success, those are usually not the things that you look back on and, and say, now I'm successful. Mm. Well, that's a, that's a really awesome place to start. How, how do you define success? I've kind of boiled it down to a really simple statement of freedom of time. Um, because I think we all, we, we all, the majority of us, at least at some point want the financial wins, right? But if you look one layer deeper of why you want those financial wins, it's, it's usually the things that come with it. It's not the actual finances. It's the freedom of time, the freedom of choices. You know, you had asked before we hit record, you know, how much time do we got? And I said, this is the last schedule thing I got for the day. So, you know, we can let it go. Uh, however long we want to go, let it go because I have that freedom of time to choose what I do and where. And then after that, I got my kid's basketball game um, or his practice. So I've never missed any of my kids' sporting games. I usually the one that takes them to practices. Um, when it's warmer weather during the summer season, you know, I walk them to school because I like to get out and spend those last little extra minutes with them. Um, so it's, it's, uh, success is usually, um, you know, a layer deeper than, than the materialistic financial kind of things that we think we want. Is that, is that consistent with the lives of the people who you admire and look up to and you consider they're really successful? Do they have that same thing? You know, that's a funny question because I don't really have a lot of people that I look up to. Not, not that there's not a lot of people I don't respect, you know, there's a lot of people I respect, but I've learned way more from people that screwed up 
and did things wrong than the people that did things right. You know, I've had, um, so I've had my agency for 15 years. So it's been a long time since I've, I've done anything other than my own thing. But some of the companies I worked for prior to starting my agency, I learned how not to do things like, and, and they were super successful people. Um, but one of them was, in particular was really toxic, right? There was really bad um, internal environment with, with the other team members. And I realized that's how you don't build a, a loyal team. And so now 15 years later, I've had one person quit. And that was a friend that was working with me. And I encouraged him to take a unique opportunity that he kind of stumbled across. So other than that, I've never had anybody quit in 15 years. And you compare that to a lot of other people and even, you know, former employers and just that toxicity that comes with it. Um, you know, so basically what I did is I learned how to, um, treat people with respect and, and hopefully provide them enough opportunities that they stay with me long term. And if I can provide opportunities to encourage them to leave me, that, then I'll do that, like in a good way. Like I want these people to win with me. And if I can't provide that environment, then I want them to win in other ways too. So I'm not selfish about the opportunities. So, um, you know, it's kind of a, a, a trick question a little bit because I've learned a lot more from those other circumstances than I have by following somebody for the way they do things right. Yeah, look, we're, we're going to dive right into right into leadership a little bit later because uh, that's that's going to be a really exciting topic to explore, especially especially given how much you've grown your business. Uh, but that was that was one example of where you've learned how to be successful from ultimately unsuccessful people, at least by your definition. Um, what other yeah. lessons have you learned? Oh man, I think uh, even on the personal side, you know, like um, like so I'm I've married also 15 years, have three kids. And, um, you know, I grew up, my parents got divorced when I was two and grew up kind of lower middle class. No, no sad story. You know, it's, I I didn't know any different, but when you look back, like those are the types of things that set your, um, work ethic. You know, I saw a really interesting meme yesterday that, that kind of, that resonated and it said something like, um, you know, I saw how hard my mom had to work or my dad had to work or my parent figure had to work. And so that's, why some of you won't relate to my hustle. Right. And so like, I can relate to that because a lot of the things that I went through, there was nothing wrong necessarily with my childhood, but I realized the opportunities that, um, I could provide for my kids. And I think more importantly, it was like stability. Right. And so what I mean by that is we used to move all the freaking time. We used to move two, three times a year. And so being able to provide a sense of, um, consistency and roots for my kids were super, was super important. And that, and, and that became a mindset I had long before I had kids. I mean, I was 30 years old when I had my first kid. And when, you know, I was in my twenties, it was like, okay, when I get married and have kids, the goal is to not move. You know, the goal is to have financial security. So that's, a, that's another good example of earlier. I was saying, you know, we always want these, these financial, this financial windfalls and securities and safety nets, but for other reasons, like when you look a layer deeper, it's usually for another reason. So I wanted financial security, not to buy fancy cars or anything. Like all my cars are 20 years old, but all of, all of the financial security that I have, I get towards things that either provide for a legacy or memories, right? So like when we, the house that I'm in right now as we're recording this, I've been here for 10 years. So we moved in here right before my, my oldest son's first birthday and way bigger house than we needed at the time. Right. So I have a, I have a six bedroom, four, four bath house. And so it was just me and my wife and a one year old moving in. Right. But the goal was to grow into this and it's worked out perfectly. And now we don't have to move. And now I have three kids and I have the home office and, and then we have a guest room. So now all of our rooms are filled. And so it's like that, that foresight to figure out ways to provide and, you know, like I said, legacy and memories. So the only place my money goes is like those places. So yes, I have a nice house, but it's for a functional reason. Other than that, all my cars are 20 years old. They're paid off. It's amazing. Like I don't need to impress anybody. But then the other places that I spend money is I bought like a lakefront cabin because I want my kids to have that legacy and, and have a place that they can look back and go, Oh, I always remember going to the cabin when we were little. And then I can pass on that cabin to my kids down, down the road, you know? So that's kind of where, I don't remember what we're talking about, what rabbit hole I'm going down, but hopefully that covered it. (laughs) 
uh, we, we got there through exploring uh, the fact that you didn't have that stability when you were growing up. And it was just so important that you had the stability. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and learning from others. Yeah. So yeah, I, I try to, uh, it's kind of become a um, habit of mine, uh, a characteristic of mine to look for those opportunities into close, closing gaps. Right. And I would even say a big part of my company's success is the same kind of thing where, um, Anytime we have an, uh, something that comes up or we could have done something better, of course, we fix the problem. But then I go, how do we plug that gap from happening again in the future? And so I got really, you know, when we start talking about more about business conversations, we can talk about documenting processes and things like that, because I lean really heavily into that. And that's contributed to the ability to scale while maintaining quality control, which is like a tricky thing, right? You Usually you can grow a business, but then you trip over yourself as you do it, because when you scale quickly, it's hard to retain quality control. So I've, I've kind of taken that same concept of, and applied it to just pretty much every area of my life. Is, it sounds like that. So obviously this plugging the gap is, is a really big concept you've applied. It kind of sounds like almost everything that you do in your life is well, well and truly planned in advance. Yeah. Or at least it's I'm not against, um, more, uh, you know, sh- I'm not against action taking in shorter capacities, but I'm very methodical about that, even that quick action too. So yeah, everything's, I don't want to say like a calculated risk, but um, I, I'd never make blind decisions. Like I'm one of those that my brain doesn't shut, shut down. I'm sure as a lot of the listeners are, but it's, you know, a good example is I wake up in the middle of the night, like mid thought in something. If I get up and I have to go use the bathroom at 3 a.m., I'm having some sort of conversation in my head already. And I wake up and I'm like, why am I solving this problem right now? <laughs> so yeah, everything is very methodical for sure. Is that what you're always doing? Just always solving problems in your head nonstop? Yeah. And it's super annoying. <laughs> it's like a blessing and a curse, right? It's good. <laughs> it's good because I, I can get to the end point. Um, I don't want to say E- easily, but probably easier than other people overthink it. And it's not that I underthink it. It's, it's just a, um, it's like a muscle that you build where you're able to trim the fat on what actually has an impact on a decision and what doesn't. So it makes it easier to make that decision. Is something you've learned over experience, like working out the muscle or is, do you feel yeah. that's, that's kind of just always been your superpower since you were young? No, it's definitely something I fine tuned. I've, I've had, I've had, um, I've had an interest in being, uh, intentional. I've always been very intentional, right? You know, one funny thing that comes to mind is when, um, uh, when gosh, I was probably, I don't know, 11, 12, 13, something like that. And, and when my, um, when my dad came to pick me up for Christmas or something, um, for those of you that remember CDs. Uh, so I got, I got this cool CD holder and it wasn't just like the 12 disc holder. It was like a, like a hundred disc holder. Like it was serious. And so when I was starting to organize my CDs, I remember my, my mom going, are you alphabetizing those? And like, that was the first thing I did was alphabetize them. Right. And so I've always been very methodical and intentional, but no, it's definitely something I've learned to leverage more strategically too. And, and it's also, I think the goal is to not overthink things, to, to think things through, to make a very educated decision, but without overthinking them, because conversely, you could have the opposite problem, right? You, the whole analysis paralysis thing you could definitely overthink things so i want to make sure i do my deal due diligence but without handicapping the progress and whatever the decision is that needs to be made so how do you draw that line because i'm sure a lot of people listening uh will get stuck in analysis paralysis especially if they're on a success journey and trying to define success for themselves how do you how do you avoid getting stuck in that analysis paralysis you're you're being methodical, you're analyzing all of it. You're let's just use a simple example of organizing your CDs and you got to alphabetize it, but do you alphabetize within categories and within genres? Are you alphabetizing the, uh, the song title or the album title or the artist or the genre? Um, this is funny. Cause so, all right, so we're just switching to a new email tool. Um, there's a tool that we're using where me and kind of my, um, my number two at the team is taking over a lot of my delegation and administrative responsibilities. And so we're setting it up so he can access my inbox, but I want it in a way where it's very transparent to 
the people that he's replying to on my behalf that's coming from him and not him sending it through me, right? Like, so we, we were trying to figure out these tools and we go, how do we organize this, right? And he's going, well, do we do email categories based on it's a business email and it's a relationship email and it's a contract email. And I'm like, uh, no, it's Damon and Vlad. <laughs> That's it. Like, why do we need to, to go deeper? So I think part of it is um, there's such a beauty in simplicity. And I think a lot of us have, have heard that. And usually the simpler the answer is the better one. So how do, how do you know what the simpler answer is? I don't know. I don't have that answer for you, but I would tell you that the way to figure it out is to try. I mean, I am, I don't really have any superpowers other than I try, like I'm not afraid to try. And I think you develop that skill set in simply trying whatever it is and not being scared to figure out the answers. Like if there's somewhere or something that I want to accomplish, I think a lot of us go, ah, uh, well, that must be nice. Or I would like to, and I never have that hesitation. Instead, I always go, oh, okay, that's Z and I'm A. How do I reverse engineer X, Y, and Z before that and continue down the path to just get there? And so I just go, I don't know the answer, but I'm gonna figure it out. And so I think trying goes a long way. And then the other, on the other side of that is, it's very unlikely that if you make the wrong decision, it's gonna detrimentally screw things up. So why do you hesitate to try? So I think over, people overthink overthinking. Right. I don't know. When, when you say try, uh, what I'm hearing is kind of the, the meaning behind commit. Uh, well, this is what I'm, this is what I want to do. I'm just going to commit to doing it. I'll find a way to make it work. It will get there. If it doesn't, I hope it doesn't get there, but I'm committed to committed to taking action and moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's probably a lot of truth to that is, um, I don't have a hesitation to understanding of things that look, either something I, I'm, I look at, I look at some of these, not all decisions, but a lot of decisions, very binary that they're either beneficial or they're not. And so what I've learned is usually if you hesitate and it's like, well, I don't know if it's beneficial or not, then skip it. Like why spend time on it? So I'm very confident in what I'm going to take action on, which then gives me the freedom to, yeah, you're probably right to commit. Because when I hear, like when I hear, Clients, for example, say, yeah, I'll, I'll try and do it. It's like, try? As soon mm -hmm. as I hear a, a coaching client say, oh, they're going to try to, um, yeah. well. they're going to try to meditate more, they're going to try and uh, spend more time with their kids, or they're going to try and finish work on time. It doesn't happen. Yeah. They're going to try. Yeah. And, then, and then there's just that Yoda quote, do or do not, there is no try. It's like, come on. Mm -hmm. Like, we, we've learned this as kids. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Every time I see... The majority of people that I meet or do business with or are friends with that have accomplished something amazing, they don't have superpowers. It's just that they understand what needs to go into solving that problem. And like you said, they commit, right? They're not looking to go zero to 10. They're looking to go zero to one. And then after one, they'll go to two. Like they're, they're not looking, and, and this, maybe this is a good segue to talk about the phases of how I grew the company because yeah, I, w I was very intentional about not getting ahead of myself. Right. And I think you can apply that in a lot of places in life. So I've had my agency for 15 years, but the first year or two, it was just myself. It was cool to be self-employed. It was cool to, to have a beer at 9 AM. Right. So <laughs> that was, that was, that was good. And so what I did is I think uh, an easy way to, communicate this is like the one analogy is, is date your opportunities, right? So for me, I would, even before I started my agency, we've always had, all of us have had a job that we didn't really like, or, or maybe it wasn't so bad, but we knew it wasn't going to be your career for long-term. And so in all those opportunities, I looked at it like dating. And so I would go, okay, here's what I like and don't like about the job. And then take from that and in applying to the next job, make sure it embraces the parts that you decided before that you like, and it avoids the parts that you don't like. And so you're fine tuning your career and what path you want to go to just as you learn the types of relationships you like and don't like to ultimately end up marrying somebody. And so it's like the same thing by the time I got to the opportunity where I real, but by the time I realized I had an opportunity with an agency, then I had done the dating 
to understand the parts of a career that or what opportunities I wanted and didn't want to feel more confident to then commit to that opportunity. So when I started, um, I mean, a big part of uh, when I first started the agency was I just didn't want to deal with the pain in the asses before of, of some of the people that I've been working with. And so when I made the leap of faith, it was when I, I realized I could still pay my bills. And so I wasn't making a ton of money by any means. Um, what it was, was I had my day job that was taking up 80% of my time, but it was probably paying 50 to 55% of my income. And the other half was coming from the side hustle that was only taking up 20% of my time. So when those, when the side hustle incrementally increased to the point where I could pay my bills. And so at the, at the point at that time, I was probably 24 or 25 years old, something like that. And so I, I had a mortgage, I had a car payment, didn't have kids yet. Um, so I, by doing the math, I could go, okay, if I eliminate the day job, which is half of my income, can I still pay the mortgage and the car payments and food and insurance and things like that? Yes. Will I be, will I be rich? Definitely not. I'm, I'm actually going to lose money, but I still have those, those needs met. And in doing that, I was able to replace the day job, free up that time, which allowed me to focus on the side hustle, which was prioritizing my clients. I was able to get that income back in, if I remember right, I mean, it was probably like two to three months. It wasn't a terribly long time because I was able to then focus. So then for a year or two after that, it was just me because it was cool to not have a ton of responsibilities outside of just those handful of clients. It was great to have the freedom of time. It was at the time my wife worked in a hospital. And so she'd get up at 3 a.m., go to work at 4. And so why not get up at 3 a.m.? I'm not doing anything else. So I got up at 3 and then I would work from like, four to nine. And earlier I joked about having a beer because nine was like midday for me. And so uh, sometimes I'd be like, why not have a beer? <laughs> and so it, like, I joke about that now cause I don't really drink nowadays, but back then it was like, you know, take from what I like and don't like from that opportunity. And then after a year or two, it was okay. The, the, the funds run its course as being a solopreneur. Now let's put on our big boy pants and see what we can do with this. And so at that time, then I started bringing on a couple of remote team members and then did that for, for probably another year or two, because here's where I talk about dating the phases. I hadn't ever managed other people. I had managed people in a phys, you know, a, a traditional job, but I hadn't ever had anybody on payroll under my own responsibility before. And so that was something that I wanted to learn. And I didn't want to overwhelm myself by going from zero to 50 employees or going from five clients to 50 clients. And so I, I went, I gave myself the freedom to go through those processes and learn from them. And then that in retrospect has made all the other phases that followed it way more sustainable. So, you know, one, one way to kind of summarize that is there's definitely a lot of people that made way more money a lot faster than I did but a big chunk of them also lost that money because they couldn't sustain it. They may have made a million dollars before me, but I've never lost my million dollars. Right. And mm -hmm. so I was able to go through those phases. And so then after the commitment, that second phase of kind of generalizing here of having a handful of, of team members, then it was like, okay, well now how do we scale fulfillment? So that's when I got really heavy into documenting processes and Documenting processes is amazing. And we all hear it and we all know it. standard operating procedures, standard operating procedures. It's the best thing ever. But until you actually do it and can quantify the benefits of it, it's a whole different conversation. So doing that absolutely sucked though. It took two or three hours every other day for a year to go through all the possible different situations. So what I do is search engine marketing. And with that, we do a lot of web design. So then I had to go, okay, what about all the wild card situations? What about all the dynamic situations? Does this website run on platform A or platform B? Is it a commerce website or a non-commerce website? Is it hosted at a good place or a bad place? So there's all these different combinations of scenarios that we could be working with on a client. And when I was documenting the processes, I never wanted to do it again, other than needing to update things as, as processes change. But I didn't want to finish it and go, ah, I kind of half-assed that one part. Now I got to go back and do it. So I really took my time to go through all those processes. And it's now it's the best thing ever because I can literally launch a, a new client's account with a 200-point checklist of tasks with perfect quality control in 30 seconds. I can go in and I can 
pick, I can pick which type of project it is. Is it um, an SEO project? And is it commerce or non-commerce? Hit go. And it's going to kick out all the fine, fine detailed tasks to all the individual responsible team members, all with staggered due dates and deadlines. And then from there, because I, I went so granular on the documentation, now the team can can carry the majority of the production while I focus on management and scaling the team. Amazing. Amazing. We've been, uh, at Purpose Advisory, we've been focusing on that for pretty much the majority of this year of identifying all the services which we're providing, of making sure that everyone who needs to complete something or that they know what tasks they've got to do, that everything links into something else. And throughout that, there have been three changes of our CRM as we've realized that we need mm -hmm. different functionality. There have been different places where we've needed to document. One place which we've been using as our client portal as well as our internal communications is closing down for everyone outside of that particular company. And so then we've got to change that as well. So everything's yeah. kind of changing as we're trying to build this this foundation. But probably the most the most fruitful outcome of all of it is that as we've been needing to identify, well, what services will we provide to clients if it's not us that are the one speaking to clients, if we're mm -hmm. hiring someone else to be doing that, well, what services are we going to be providing? Well, we've got to identify it somehow. And then we started focusing on client outcomes and client objectives or client clients meeting their goals as opposed to uh, what services of ours might be able to help clients. And so then our entire service yeah. packages started recreating. And I, I'm, my guess is it's still probably going to take another six months until we even get that clarified. But yeah. there's, there's no way that, like if I wasn't influenced by people such as yourself, there's no way that I would have, I would have gone down that path and then identified an even better way of being able to provide services to clients. No chance. No yeah. chance we would have gone down that path. Um, yeah, no, doing that process sucks. It sucks. I'm not going to say it's sexy at all because it's not, but the outcomes of it are super sexy. Yeah. And it kind of sounds, oh, hang on, let, let's continue with the phases of your growth. So you, uh, so you then got to a stage of making sure that everything was really systemized before trying to uh, grow again or before beginning to scale with clients and team. And so then what was next? Yeah, so then we kind of rode that way for a little bit of improving the processes with existing clients, but then all the the gears started clicking and supporting each other where um, the accountability in th the careful documentation started to be recognized by clients even more. So historically, prior to, prior to other than just the last two years, our only source of leads was referrals. So, which is, which is kind of ironic, right? Cause we're a marketing company. We don't do any marketing for ourselves, uh, but, but by improving that quality control even more, we never had a problem with quality control. We just made it even better. And then in doing that, it attracted more leads because we drove even better results. And then the accountability and the documentation became a selling point of itself. A lot of times when we get referrals now, it's, it's largely, um, you know, things like you commented on, you know, if, so, if, if it weren't people like you to inspire me to go through these documentation processes, then I probably wouldn't do it. And messages like that are started getting relayed to leads where, Hey, they're the most transparent SEO company I've ever worked with. They're, they're the most hands-off agency that they take all the heavy lifting and do it for you. And so that started to be able to, to be identified through our communications because we, we even document, um, our touch points with our clients, like, Hey, at week one, set expectations by telling them where we're at on these things. And then, um, month one, send them a handwritten thank you card that says, thanks for the opportunity to work with you. And so all those things that we did for documentation and setting expectations started to be value propositions that clients would share on our behalf. And then they become the raving fans. Now, the other thing that led to to kind of bring us to the current phase is about two years ago, I started leaning heavy into social proof. So what I mean by that is, uh, you know, sharing expertise on social media, but here's the thing is, is two years that came as a result of me completely shutting down social media. So at the time, so it was November, 2019, if I remember right. Um, I really only had Facebook and then I also had a LinkedIn account, but I just didn't use it. Like I'd had it for, I think it still had like my old job from 10 years ago on it. And it was just this dusty resume. 
So I mostly only use Facebook. And at the time I had a real hard line where it's like, no, Facebook is personal and I don't want to invite clients into that world. And so anytime I'd have a client add me, I would just ignore it. And part of that was also because if you go, um, you know, the first article I ever wrote for Forbes, it was titled something like constant connectivity does not equal productivity. And so in it, I talked about how I don't give clients my cell phone number. And I also talked about how I don't have Facebook Messenger on my phone. So that was part of the other thing where I would keep that hard division between personal life and work life. And so when, when about two years ago, when I only had Facebook, I just got kind of tired of it. You know, nothing specific happened, but as we all know, it's just kind of the ramblings and the drama and the politics. It was just kind of boring and I wasn't using it for, I wasn't using it intentional. And so then I, I realized, why am I using it at all then? So I, I, we all know that if you delete Facebook, it doesn't really delete it. So, so here's what I did. My wife was, is amazing. And so she went through, I had her log into my account and went through and manually unfriended every person I had, I was a contact with manually deleted every post I had made manually deleted every comment I had ever made on anybody else's thing, manually deleted every private message I've ever had with anybody. Wow. And so I bet you some of these people are going, Holy shit, you trust your wife that much. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a whole other conversation. Yes, absolutely. hundred percent. You're saying your wife went in and manually deleted everything. Yeah. Yeah. She went in there. It took her three weeks. Cause my wife is, you know, she's fortunate and she st gets to stay home with the kids. So she had the opportunity to kind of go through there in between mom duties and, and just clear it out. So I deleted everything. And then I tell you that because that's what birthed um, the next big growth phase in our company. Because after I deleted it, when I gave you that background, I said that I didn't really let clients into that world. But then I started to realize I had like one or two that did get in that world. And I now no longer had an easy way to communicate with them. I couldn't send them the private message and it wasn't frequent, but maybe once a month they would. And now I couldn't. And so then I had to figure out how do I, how, how do I initiate the conversation? Like how do I, how do I establish those touch points? So then I got thinking, well, why can't I do social media my way? And I didn't know what that meant at the time, but I was willing to figure it out right earlier. We talked about trying. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to try and figure out social media and how I can use it in a productive way while also balancing authenticity and, you know, really the way that I would post and not just trying to do viral stuff or lead magnet stuff. So I turned back on Facebook and I had no friends because my wife removed them all. I had no content to look at anything. So then I started going back and going, okay, who, who do I want to engage with? And my list prior, my contact list prior to deleting everything was somewhere around 1200, 1300, no more than 1500 people. And when I went back through and added people that I either wanted to engage with, um, and then, and then the friends and family kind of thing, there's only like 300. I don't know who the other 1200 people are, but, but, that there were some though that I go, Oh yeah, I remember I was contact and connected with this person, but that's not who I want in this world. So I became very intentional about my social media environment. So even the people that I want to stay in touch with maybe old friends, but they weren't going to support the new objectives. I would just unfollow them. So we were still connected. We could still engage with each other, but they weren't a distraction. And like, there's your little pro tip right there is I see people all the time talk about how toxic Facebook is. It totally is, but mine isn't. Mine mm -hmm. is just nothing but positivity and productivity and encouragement because there's all the other people I still want to stay connected with. I just don't see all the crap. I don't see all the drama. I just unfollow. You, you basically mute them, but then they're available for you to have a conversation with if you need to send a private message. So then I started going, well, why don't I also use LinkedIn? Because that seems like where my audience is because my product is a B2B product. And then I don't have to deal with, even, even though I'm going to groom Facebook to be a productive environment, LinkedIn has less of an opportunity to have to babysit it than Facebook does. And so why don't I start publishing content there too? So here's where growth started to happen is I said, I, d I don't know what specifically, I, what my social media content strategy is going to be, but I know what I don't want it to be. I don't want it to be negative. I'm never going to talk about politics. I'm never going to talk about religion because that's really kind of how I am in real life. I don't really care to get into those discussions. Not that I don't have my own personal opinions, 
but there's no point in really having a discussion with about them because you're not going to change the other person's mind. And I, and I don't need to, I don't want to, like, I respect those other people's opinions. So like if somebody wants to have it and it's not that I can't have a healthy discussion about those topics, it's usually most other people can't. So why even open up that opportunity? So I said, I'm going to focus on the things that I am passionate about, which is, you know, business and marketing, but then also my family. But here's, here's the catch that I figure out. I don't mind being somewhat of a public figure, but I'm hyper protective of my privacy of my family. So how do I share those moments of appreciation about my wife and kids without sharing identifiable information? So anytime I post um, a picture about my love, my wife, it's one that she's already posted or is okay with me posting any picture of my kids are always unidentifiable. So then that's like the next layer of the equation is, okay, well, how do you, how do you share the intimate moments of your family and the things that you appreciate with other people while also not exposing a sensitive information or identifiable information, because I don't want to be the guy that's over here with my cell phone going, Hey son, turn around so I can get a picture of the back of your head. Right. So mm -hmm. I had to figure out how to share those, those real moments without expo without crossing the privacy line that I wanted to protect. So like one example that I remember when I first started getting into this process was, um, it was winter and I had just taken the kids sledding and I wanted to talk about how I took them sledding. So I went through my pictures to find one that I could use. So that way I don't have to like stage these fake social media pictures. But then I, what I found was one of me kind of doing like a selfie. And then the kids were back in the distance going down the hill a couple hundred feet away. So then, it, then it was a real picture really in the moment, but they weren't identifiable. So for me, it was really important to figure out what that dance was. Like, how do I, how do I express my voice in the way that I want to talk about my passionate interests in work and then my appreciation for my wife and kids while also protecting the things that I want to protect. So I tell you all that because the first two or three months of when I started doing social proof, I didn't get any traction at all. And it was figuring out, like I said, what that voice was. And then maybe by months three or four, then it started to pick up some visibility and I started getting more engagement, started getting some private messages. And then by month nine, so I'm as of the time of recording this, this is about a two year process. But back at the nine month mark, I quantified it. And it was the first and only time I quantified it. And it had added $150,000 in contracts just from that process of sharing expertise and being sharing some of those vulnerable moments on the personal side. And since then, I haven't quantified it because that was clearly enough proof of concept to continue doing it. I had an interest in sharing those stories. I had an interest in helping people. And so it's exponentially, it's grown exponentially since then. And now I have other processes where I help that my team helps me scale that while also protecting the integrity of my voice. And I still write everything myself, but they help me manage the engagement. And so I, I tell you all this because that's kind of brings us to the current phase now. And so now I've been able to build out a seven figure agency without ever spending a dollar on ads while still having that freedom of time and then attracting the types of clients I want to do business with. What, what's maybe the last thing I'll, I'll leave on this topic is what's interesting about this model is it eliminates the sales process. Like I don't have, I don't have, a, I don't have a sales representative. I don't have a salesperson. I don't have a funnel. I don't have an email list. I don't have anything. What happens is people are either referred to me and they're, they come from such a trusted word of somebody that they respect, which is a client of ours, um, that they, they basically come in and say, Hey, I already know what you do. How do we start? Or if it comes from the social proof concept, they can, they, they follow me for the business expertise, but they convert on the personal posts. Mm -hmm. So I'll get people that say, Hey, I know you do SEO and that's really cool. We're going to talk about that in a minute, but that was really cool. What you said about your wife, can we jump on a zoom call? Right. And then when we get on these zoom calls, there's, there's almost no sales engagement whatsoever. It's like, Hey, I know how this works because I'm always setting those expectations. I'm always top of mind. I'm always sharing the journey and, and they've been educated on that. And so it's like a win-win because then I attract the type of people that I want to do business with that vibe with who I am. And then when they're ready to do business with, it's none of that awkward sales negotiations either. So it's like a win-win. I, I remember seeing one of your posts from a few weeks ago, a few months ago when there was a, a loose track uh, about a um, billion dollar company or whatever it was, uh, which you just refused to do business with. Yeah. So, so on that one, um, 
I ended it by saying, so basically what, for the listeners, what the post was is there was a, a tech company that I had the opportunity to do some co- consulting for and um, really cool product, really cool people. Uh, just the politics of the, the agreement wouldn't create a productive working environment. So I declined them. And when I, so I, I made a post a couple of days later saying that, you know, you could still protect the integrity of your brand and the types of people you want to work with and say no to big deals. Like it would have been cool to put them on the resume and say that we did, we did some campaigns with them, but not at the expense of, um, the, the working environment, not at the expense of inviting a, a toxic political environment with bureaucracy that just interrupted the campaign success, which then makes us look bad. And so when I turned it, so I made a post saying, Hey, you know, stand up for the types of projects you want to work on. Yes. It, it sucks to lose, lose the contract. But what I ended the post in saying is something like this isn't a lost sale. Now it's just a delayed better sell later. And I said, mm-hmm. I guarantee you by the end of the year, I'll have another billion dollar lead. And I just posted this week that we have a billion dollar lead that's twice as large. So the first company I think was valued at 4.4 billion and this new lead is 11.1 billion. And you know what they converted on is, is a post, not the, the billion dollar, the previous one. That not, not that one, but one very similar to it. And it, it was one that, that said the same kind of thing, like, you know, hold your ground. It was a post, um, I had my daughter on my shoulders and again, the unidentifiable thing. And so like her hair was in the way. Right. And so it was a post talking about how, um, we've increased our rates. We've had to say no to some clients, which sucks because I want to help people, but I have to prioritize, um, where I spend my time and where my, my team spends their time so I can protect those things that are important, like family. And that's what converted them. And so the first billion dollar lead were, you know, wanted all my time. And then the second billion dollar lead converted because I protected my time. And it sounds like if you got that first billion dollar lead, you wouldn't have had capacity for the second billion dollar lead. Yeah. I mean, that was part of why I said no is because I knew the needy environment that we would have been walking into. Mm. That's incredible. I just, um, like this, I think a lot of people who are listening will be some of them kind of aspiring entrepreneurs. A lot of them, uh, just people focusing on building up their career and trying to be as successful as possible in their career. And I think that's something which a lot of people forget. They think, Oh no, that's my boss. I can never say no to my boss or, Oh no, I really hope they like me or they go into an interview. Are they interviewing me? What are you talking about? You're interviewing them the same. Yeah. Yeah. They're paying you money, but you're paying with your time and that's even more valuable. So you better value that. Yeah. And that's, that's when you adopt a superpower. When, when you realize those things that it goes two ways, you can't go wrong because what either happens is you avoid the toxic environments that you would have walked into, which is a win, or you find the environments that are exciting that you want to embrace and walk into. So you can't really go wrong by, by standing up for the things that you value. Um, it's interesting that we're kind of talking about this because I have, um, one of, one of my kind of extended family members, um, we went up to, it it was actually up at our cabin and we were out at the fire, um, late at night and we were, they they were kind of, we were having conversations where they were picking my brain about things and, and they're in like a nine to five job. And they started talking about how, they they've just lost the interest in their job and largely due to the management and lack of appreciation. And, and, and then they started, you could tell that they were really passionate about what they did and they were talking about how there's opportunities for improvement within the company that, that the company is overlooking. And I said, well, why don't you go tell your supervisor those? She's like, oh, I don't want them thinking that I'm stepping on their toes or overreaching. And I'm like, no, the right supervisor will appreciate you for that. And so she, it, something in it really stuck with her because it was it was me talking about finding the and create finding or creating the environments that make you happy because she was slowly becoming less happy in that environment. And so I, I kept nudging her saying, I guarantee you, you won't get fired if you bring this up. And she got fired. Just kidding. She didn't. So what she did. <laughs> I was say, if she got fired after bringing up a way of improving the business, man, she, that's a blessing. Get out of there. It would have been. Yeah. No, but you know what happened is she quit. 
she went yeah. the whole other the whole other route. She realized um, there's more to gain in life and and more to appreciate in doing different things. I'm not going to say what she does or anything because I don't want to call her out who she is. But she's in a dramatically different environment. Like now, she it went from let's see if I can generalize this. You know, it went from like a nine to five m- medical job to overnight like i'll just she works at 911 dispatch now totally different job right and she that's what she likes she likes those intense environments where she she can be the helpline for somebody right and so she's gone from very corporate white collar nine to five to super random hours with high stress circumstance and she loves it she's posting all the time about um how she's found like her happy place and how she's happy that she can make an impact on people. And I don't even know, like I haven't asked her anything about pay. Like, I don't know if pays up or down, but it doesn't matter because she's happy now. Yeah. Well, ultimately she's getting paid. Oh, she's using her time in the way that she wants to, which means the money's going to be less important. Yeah. Uh, Not completely insignificant. We still got bills to pay, mortgage to pay, all that kind of jazz. Yeah. But it's just so much more, so much more fruit in that. And, And I love this. This theme which you've which you've been talking about uh, this whole time we've been chatting what twenty minutes an hour I'm, I'm losing track of time. Where but I, I, hour, love, yeah. I love this I love this theme that you've continued to talk about, which is living in line with your values. You yeah. you've shared a whole bunch of values which you've said time and time again in different ways that you're just not going to live in a way which doesn't line up with those values. Yeah. Your, whether that's uh, protecting people's privacy or if it's about being authentic online, if it's about using your time in the right way, or if it's about being able to do what you want to do when you want to do it. Has that yeah. been something really, really intentional for you as I'm living in line with my values? Or has it just been kind of subconscious thing which comes in whenever you're making decisions? Probably somewhere in between. Um, for me, it's not... I, I, I don't have... The, in my mind, it's not me rationalizing. If it's not me rationalizing against values, it's rationalizing against happiness. So, do I go? Oh, does this align with my values? I don't. I couldn't tell you the last time it it crossed my mind in that direct comparison. But all the time, it's crossing my mind. Um, would that make me happy or not? Or it's the majority of the decisions I make nowadays are about protecting my mental bandwidth. And so it's like layers, right? So it's probably um, val- values are in in those layers, um, and I just get to it th- a different way. But for me, it's like, will if I add this to my calendar, will it either save me time in other areas? Because if it doesn't, then it better make me happier in other areas. So like, I'm on a freaking chopping mission right now to eliminate as many things as possible. It's so funny. The processes you go through, um, as as you grow and mature and it's like we, we, as we're younger, we think that it's material goods and it's largely just because of the culture that we're brought up in and, and it's unintentional. But then you start to realize all the things that you acquire are all the things that piss you off. So when you buy the big house, Who's going to clean it when you get the big yard? Who's going to mow it? Who's going to shovel the snow? Like when you get the, like another example is I bought jet skis. I never used them. I used them like one time because I was so frustrated with the thought that I had to winterize them. And then when spring came around, I had to unwinterize them. And so I have, I'm like running into the mechanics back and forth and like spending all and having to go renew the registrations. And, um, same thing with like campers. We had, campers and like when you're using those things they are super awesome but all the other 360 days out of the year when you're not using them the mental bandwidth that they take up was just too annoying for me and a lot of people probably think i'm like ocd or something and it's not that it's that i don't it's i'm i'm simplistic i want to be simplistic you realize there's happiness in simplicity now i don't go to the extreme of minimalism although it sounds super sexy to me I also like modern conveniences, so I'm not about to get rid of all my clothes and shoes and things like that. But I, I can't imagine you turning into Marie Kondo. 
Yeah, no, I mean, you got to figure out your balance, right? So, um, if it was, if, if I had to pick, if, if there was a scale and minimalism was at zero and ultra materialistic is at a hundred, I might probably like the 30% guy because I'm way more towards the minimalistic side or pushing further towards that side than I am the materialistic side because all those things, um, dude, they stress me out. They stress me out so bad. Um, and it's funny because the, the smaller, the thing that is a stress, the, the older I get, the more it stresses me out because I know I don't need that. Like, why am I letting something so tiny stress me out? And so then it stresses me out even more <laughs> because I, because it'd be so simple to solve. Just, just don't have that thing. So. Yeah, man, this is, this is awesome that you're sharing this because you're seeing, I, I remember reading a, st- a statistic uh, about people in the U S I think I was looking at overall U S uh, residential space versus storage space. And I think it was oh, really? almost one to one. I'd believe it. I, I would totally I, believe it. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I'm, I'm from Australia. I'm, I'm not in the U S but I mean, I know a lot of people have storage here in Australia, but nowhere near that extreme. Yeah. Like one to one. Well, and that's, I would totally believe that because a lot of residences that you drive by, if you see the garage cracked open, it's a storage, right? Their, their cars are parked in the driveway and not in the garage where they should be. Um, it's, it's funny how you grow into the space that you have. And this is something I've been talking to my wife about a lot recently is so we have, we have a house that we've grown into all the rooms are occupied, but we still have like flexible space and storage space. How did we magically consume all of that extra space too? So (laughs) it's like, we just cleaned out this cabinet in, in the kitchen. And I was so excited to have like a minimally used cabinet because it just is so nice to not have to think about what's in there and to know that you're gonna have to clean it, especially if you have kids, right? Like I could clean, my wife could clean the house this morning and by the time we go to bed, it's a freaking disaster already. So it's like the less you have, the less you have to clean. And so it's like this, this win-win, but you know, this kitchen cabinet is, uh, we cleaned it out and then all of a sudden a month later, it's full. How is it full? Where did this stuff come from? So over last weekend, I just went on a cleaning mission and wiped out half our stuff in our, in our closets and our cabinets and our entertainment centers. Uh, yeah. I mean, the less you have, the less you have to worry about. And and right. you start to, when you start to pay attention, those are the things that are stressing you out. It's it's usually the little things that are stressing out. Lots of little things. I, I remember my, my wife and I, well, before we had our daughter, we were moving house, buying, selling renting out our place, buying another place, all, the, all that kind of stuff. We, we moved probably uh, six or seven times uh, over a, know, like a seven-year period, seven to eight-year yeah. period. And every time you move, you realize how much crap you accumulate, how much junk yeah. there is. And it, it still astounds me. It's like, well, I've got to put all my clothes away. All right, if I'm packing my clothes, getting ready, like a literally to go clear out the closet, well, let's just cull all the stuff which which I haven't worn in the last two years mm-hmm. or the last one year. If I'm not, if I haven't worn it for two seasons, <laughs> why why do I still have this? Yeah. Uh, oh, I kept it because you know when I was 18 years old, it was it was really cool. It was my favorite t shirt. So yeah, but you're not going to yeah. wear it now. Well, sure. Yeah. I mean, but I could wear it again one one day. One, one day. day. <laughs> but it's but it's like it's got holes in it. If you want to wear it, you're going to have to stitch it up again. It's yeah. like, oh, that is more effort, but that's okay. I might wear it one day. Yeah. Or or <laughs> you might you might stitch it one day. Yeah, I might stitch it one day. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I might take it out of a future closet one day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's might- um, that's my go-to lately is the closet. Uh, there's somehow, you know, between birthdays and Christmas and stuff like that, um, more clothes just end up in there somehow. <laughs> I've, I mean, I've considered just clearing out uh, probably about 80% of my cabinet and then just getting the rest of the clothes all almost identical, like the same style, the same everything. And then just not have to worry about what I'm going to wear or what I'm going to take there, out. There are a lot of hyper successful people that do that. Like Mark Zuckerberg does that. I think Sam mm-hmm. Ovens does that. Um, and it goes back to the mental bandwidth. Like you don't realize how much those tiny decisions consume your day. 
And so if you just el eliminate the necessity to have those decisions, you know, that's a good example of, of, I don't know if I'd go to that extreme, but I, I appreciate the concept. Like it's really attractive to me to do that. Um, but at the same time, I also think that there'd be some mental bandwidth on the other side where I'd get really annoyed wearing the same thing every day. <laughs> <laughs> I think I remember for a completely different reason. I remember Daniel Radcliffe did that uh, because he was sick and tired of paparazzi following him all the time. So it just wore the exact yeah. same thing every so day. They can't distinguish the pictures. That and it looks weird. like they've just done the exact same photos every time. Amazing. Uh, but probably for a different reason. Yeah. So let, let's let dive in a little bit to leadership because you've got uh, – how, how many employees do you have now? Uh, I think we're at 60 now. You're at 60. So starting from literally just you 15 years ago and then it was – I think it was still just you like 13 years ago and then it was only five of you what, five years ago or so? Um, no, so we're at the 15 year mark now, creeping up on 16, I believe. Um, so for the first year or two, it was just me. Years two through four was maybe two other people. Years four through eight was probably five to 10. Mm -hmm. um, and then years eight through 14 was like 12 to 15. At the beginning of this year, we had 15. So we've gone from 15 to 60 in the last nine months. Okay. So tell, tell me in the lead up to, or at least everything you want to share about leadership. Uh, in the lead up to you know, nine months ago and then the last nine months? Um, the, there, there was a lot of forward thinking. I, I knew, I knew that growth was coming because it was one of those, those phases, right? We talked about dating the phases and I had, I was getting towards the end of my dating relationship of the last phase. And so I had ran out of the reasons. So I talked about the value in not rushing and understanding and learning from those phases. And I felt like I got to a point where I didn't really have a lot more to learn by not forcing myself to grow. And so then it became, I got to the point where it was like, why do I not shoot for the moon now? And so I knew that I was leaning towards forcing myself into growing exponentially. And I didn't know what the catalyst would be, but I could tell it was coming. And so what ended up happening is I started, so I started putting kind of my, my antenna, up, my theoretical antennas for the types of people that I would need to, to fill some roles. And it was less about production and more about leadership because we talked about documenting processes. And so scaling wasn't a problem. It wasn't a problem with scaling fulfillment because as long as I could find people with um, the skill set needed, then I could plug them into the documentation and they couldn't screw it up. So, so that just, part to, just to clarify, what do you mean when you said fulfillment? Whatever the tasks at hand are that we need to do for our team, for our clients. So um, all the SEO things. So writing content, doing graphic design, all those things related to a website. It, I didn't have any concern about the ability to scale the product we provide. Yeah. My, my attention was focused more on how do we protect what we've built so far and scale that unique culture at a larger, uh, at a larger capacity because we've grown because clients appreciate the relationships and the expectations that we set. How do I maintain that? We've grown and we have good re um, team retention because I care about my team beyond just numbers and beyond just their con contributions. I care about them and their family. I ask how their kids are doing. And so maybe, maybe before we go too deep here in a minute, maybe we come back to that comment about um, caring for your team because there's a lot of unique things that, that um, unique stories that have come from that. So my attention was more like, how do I protect what we've done already and then do it bigger. And so I had kind of my, my antennas up for how do I, who's going to fill those responsibilities? Cause I'm running out of daemon. I'm running out of daemon to go around on those soft scale things. And so I was always looking for somebody that could protect the team and kind of be the team cheerleader. And that person would likely come internally because they're already exposed to that environment. So I had one team member that I thought would be a great role. And I was kind of encouraging them over the years. Like they had this opportunity a long time ago. Um, it wasn't something that we absolutely needed at the time. So it wasn't painful. And I didn't want to force him into a role that he couldn't see himself in yet, but I knew he was the right fit. And so as the team started to grow, he started to finally see those opportunities and he started to see, um, his personal interest in those. And so I asked him, 
a couple months ago and I said, where do you see yourself long-term with the company? And he had been thinking about that for months and he, and he reached out maybe two, three months ago and said, um, Hey, that really stuck with me when you asked me that. And I've been thinking about it ever since. And I want to be the team cheerleader. And so now he, he already had the skills, but now, now he believes in himself that he has those skills. And so now he can take over, uh, like now he's doing payroll for me and now he's doing, um, ongoing education. So now he's going through all the team members and saying, you know, what can we provide? What create, what courses, what training, what, whatever can we provide to help you within your existing skill set? And beyond that, what else do you want to learn? Even if it's in a different department or different skill set, like Damon has passed down this culture that we want you to find that happiness, even if it's outside the scope of your current responsibilities. So like a side comment to that is even when I hire new people, um, I ask them, you know, the, we go through a lot of questions, but I primarily focus on two questions. So one is what are you good at? And two is what do you like doing? Cause those can be dramatically different answers. And I focus yes. on the second one. I focus on what they like to do <clears throat> because just because they're good at something doesn't mean they like to do it. And if they get stuck doing the same job, well, guess what? They just left your, another company to come to yours and they're going to do the same thing to you. They're going to get burned out on doing the same thing. So I try to position people in responsibilities for things that they like to do personally. Um, so then, um, lose my train of thought here. So we were talking about, um, leadership, hiring people, bringing people up leadership. Okay. So that's, so that's one team member is on the internal side. Um, so then on the other side, it was like, okay, how do I, how do I scale? Um, how do I bring somebody in on the leadership roles? So, so we talked about the internal side. Now, how do we, how do we scale or protect the external side, like the client relationships and things like that? So then, um, basically what I had to do is figure out how to place somebody, how to find the right people, with, how to find people with the right soft skills. And so what I mean by that is somebody that can, that will have an interest in protecting the things that I want to protect. It's not hard to find another copywriter or another web designer or another anything. There's millions of them out there, but it is hard to find a copywriter that cares or a web designer that understands the bigger picture. So I had to start focusing on, on those soft skills and putting people in places where they could, they would be proud to take ownership. Like they wouldn't do it just for a paycheck, but I could actually trust their judgment because it, because I'm confident that they understand uh, what the greater objective is within that, within that role. So once I started to find those positions, then, um, you know, what contributed to the growth to needing those positions filled was a combination of a few things, but I could probably, um, abbreviate it down to, to two reasons. One is COVID. Um, and the other is, um, a lot of seeds planted that had blossomed around the same time. So what well, I'm a, I'm a big relationship person. And so what we talked about how I, I get on social media and LinkedIn and, and I, I go, here's an SEO problem. Here's the answer. Here's a business question. Here's the answer. Here's a remote team management question. Here's the answer. And I, and I don't expect anything in return. I don't send them to a landing page. I don't send them to a funnel. I don't send them to an email list. And so that establishes my credibility and then keeps me top of mind. So then when they do need the thing, then they, then they come reach out to me. So, um, by doing that, it planted a lot of seeds and created a lot of relationships that later when those people were ready, I just had a chunk of them that came within uh, over the, over the months this year that were finally ready. Now, part of that is I said COVID. So my company's on the fortunate side where as far as business is concerned, um, COVID increased a lot of demand for what we do. And so the combination of relationships that I had established that blossomed around that time, and then COVID could have accelerated some of those too, because, um, you know, it's always funny to me to go, oh, people learned that they need to be on the internet because the internet has been around for a while now. And a lot of us will be like, well, duh, everything goes on, on the internet, but you would be amazed at how many massively successful businesses have a horrible website or not even a website at all. And so COVID pushed a lot of those people, gave them that one tiny little nudge they needed to go, Oh yeah, I guess I better take this internet thing more seriously. So I think it was just a unique combination of establishing that expertise and trust through social proof, which drove 
a source of leads. And even the people that follow me online that didn't become clients, they told other people about what we do because I established a subconscious relationship with them through sharing my expertise. And so it was just a lot of, um, a, a lot of, uh, intentional effort in helping other people's and other people in different ways that just kind of came back and returned itself. And so throughout all of that, it, it sounds like for you, it's just been find all the ways to add value while making sure that your family is safe and has financial security and probably independence and freedom by now. Uh, but just continue to make sure that you're adding as much value as possible without worrying about how much you're getting paid. Because if yeah. you're doing the right things, or at least in align with your values, then the money will eventually come. It might take longer, but you'll keep it. Yeah. And it's so annoying to say that because it sounds so cliche, but it's true. Yeah. When I put out those efforts in, um, like I said, I only quantified the LinkedIn thing one time. Um, that was uh, over a year ago and, and it's done nothing but grow since then. Mm. And so, so if we go back to leadership, you're, you're talking about how you hire people based on what are they good at and what do they want to do? And if those align, perfect. If they don't, are you able to train them up? Like, do they have capacity or capability to learn to do what they really want to do? Mm -hmm. But then you make sure that they're value aligned. And how do you scale? You, know, you, brought, you brought one person to kind of have those soft skills of managing the team. I think you called them the team cheerleader. What, yeah, and that's it's, basically it's, a, a management role, right? Like an like yeah. a HR manager sort of role? Kind of, yeah. If you got a better title, um, him and I are actively seeking one for him. <laughs> <laughs> cheerleader. I don't know if he wants to be called the cheerleader. Yeah. Um, um, uh, so, so is the question, how did I fill those roles at scale? Is that? Yeah, kind of you kept you kept filling roles. Like, do you only have one person who's managing everything, or do you have uh, some more senior people who delegate the subtasks to the other teams? Like, what 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 are the teams? What are the structure? How's it built out? So my goal is to reduce management as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is largely accomplished through documentation, right? So we talked about the standard operating procedures. Um, I avoided any sort of management concept for as long as I could. And the only reason why I introduced those other people is because I was just running out of me, you know, to protect those those relationships internally and externally. So beyond those two, those two people, no, we don't have management roles. So the way that we, we operate is largely through, like, I, I find, I, I, I recruit people that look, I either trust you or I don't. And so you develop a sixth sense as a leader for the types of excuses that imply that somebody wouldn't be effective in a certain role. And so I try to, I try to systematize the boarding process. And so what I do is I try to proactively eliminate bad applicants before I even have to have a conversation with them. So like some examples might be um, in the, in the job application. So in, in the job listing, I'll do what I call, like a, like a compliment sandwich where at the top, it's like you, you say the things that they're interested in and the bottom, you say the things that they're interested in. And in the, in the middle is where you put the disqualifiers. You put what are, you know, some people call Easter eggs. So in a job listing, I might say, Hey, you know, we're a, a fast growing company and here's all the cool things and you're awesome and we're awesome and let's be friends. And then down at the bottom, I put the pay, you know, Hey, I pay this, I pay that. Here's the structure. Here's the incentives, whatever. But then in the middle, I put the specifics that I want them to qualify or disqualify themselves uh, with the, with the job responsibility. So if it's, let's say I'm hiring a new developer, I've, I've systematized the process where I can basically copy and paste the job listing. And so in the role of a, of a developer, I have offline, I have like a pretend mock-up website. And then every time I need to hire a new developer, I load that online somewhere. And in the middle of that, that little job listing I put, do not message me on this job platform. I'm not going to check my private messages instead Skype me. And when you Skype me, you better, you know, go to this, go to this test URL. There's 10 questions. Don't Skype me unless you have the answer to those 10 questions. So what that does is it, is it eliminates the 
the delay and the small talk and the misdirected um, qualifying of the applicant. And so they save time, I save time. And when they go look at this thing, I intentionally put a lot of false positives into it. So I put things that only a qualified developer would, some of them may understand what the question is, but the ones that don't, great. They're not going to message me on Skype. The ones that do understand the question, but maybe they don't know how to find the answer. Great. They're not going to message me on Skype. So I only get the people that have made it past that first qualification of answering those things. And so when they Skype me, if they don't include those 10 answers, they didn't follow the directions. So I don't even accept the Skype. I used to get distracted by the resumes and I used to go check my private messages and I used to accept the replies where they didn't do that first question. Like sometimes for the other roles outside of developers, sometimes I'll say, when you Skype me, tell me your favorite color. If I don't see the first thing that their favorite color is blue or something, I don't accept it. It's those tiny details that help me better understand how good they are at, at A, reading and B, following directions. Because if they pass all those those tests and then they we welcome them to the team, that's the type of person that I want, that I can just give directions and trust them. I don't have to babysit and micromanage. I don't want to micromanage. I don't want to hire managers that have to micromanage. So I, I put in a lot of front-loaded effort to pre-screening um, applicants kind of systematically. And then once they make it through that, then that's when we, we do what we talked about earlier is like, well, cool. What do you actually like to do now? And so I can try and put them in a position that they can grow with us. That's amazing. I just, just hearing how much you've systemized it, just simply putting those, those various kind of hurdles, but they're not massive hurdles. It's not like saying, do this and this and this and this and this and these billion things in order to prove that you're worthy to even have a conversation yeah. with me. It's saying, I'd love to have a chat with you. Let's just see if you're serious about it. Yeah, let's let's not waste each other's time. Uh, and some people may interpret that as um, me being unrealistic, but you brought up a great point. Like, No, it's not like I'm not expecting these people to work for free. I'm not having them actually do anything that takes more than five or ten minutes. Um, and then if they, if they do pass that, like – the like designers are a good example. So designers, what I might do is something similar. So what I started to do is save all these roles because I usually hire the same type of people. I usually hire a developer, a designer, or a copywriter. Like those are the three main things that, that I'm hiring at scale. And so then I just started s saving those job listings. And then I also started saving the test tasks after that. So if they answer those, um, you know, so maybe for a designer, I might say, in the middle, don't message me on this on this message board. Instead, Skype me and tell me your favorite color. Well, cool. If they Skype me and tell me their favorite color, then they pass that first test. Then after that, I, then I will. If if I want to better understand their skill set and it will take time, I pay them for it. So I say, cool. How about I give you fifty bucks to do this thing? It'll take thirty to sixty minutes. That way, if it doesn't work out, then I didn't waste your time. We can both respect each other. But then you'll also understand if I decline to proceed. So the you know that brings up an, um, another topic is that I'm always trying to show them respect in some, in some capacity. Um, so when they come on, like, I don't care when my team works. I don't care what days they work. I don't care what hours they work because all the systems are documented. They're either doing the work or not. And it's very easy for me to determine if they're doing the work or not. So why would I care if they're working at 8 a.m. or 8 p.m.? But then that gives them a level of self-governance and then also a level of appreciation because th there's a funny thing that happens when you trust people that they, they appreciate that so that there's always little points of opportunity that i'm trying to show appreciation even in the very beginning so um like in that opportunity it's like no i don't want to take advantage of them and expect to do anything for free in fact i'll probably pay them more then it's worth for the test task just to show them that I'm serious. And, and the majority of times I send the money in advance. So instead of, you know, them having to trust me, I'm trusting them. And so that's, that's like a token of appreciation where I'm going, Hey, I, I have faith in you. So here's your money. Now send me the test results in the next day or two. And let's see if, if I like them or not. You know? Yeah. Incredible. And that, that that's perfect for the ones where you've got specific tasks for like a developer or I don't know, marketing or, uh, graphics or whatever. How do you approach that when it comes to something like admin, where they've actually got to be in the business and in the systems and learn it before they can do something? I'd probably give them a theoretical example. Um, 
so maybe some maybe some comparisons that might answer it is I have somebody that I'm trying to hire that does research right now. And so it's not as binary. It's not like one, two, three, you know, it's with, with when you do development, you have a mock-up and you build the site and you're done with research. You don't know what you're walking into. Like you don't know if there's a hundred things you could dig into or 10,000 things you could dig into. And then as you dig into the data, some of the data you're going to look at is going to be good. Some of it's going to be bad. So it's a, a lot more dynamic situation. So in those type of things, I try to, I try to understand the, the paths that they choose. So we have a researcher that's doing a test right now. And I said here, here, I just went and Googled a random website and asked them to figure out the objectives that we're trying to figure out for a real client. But then I put them in a, a real circumstance and I intentionally don't give them a lot of direction. So it'll just be like, Hey, I need you to figure out X, Y, and Z research. And here's a fake website. Tell me how far you get, because I want to see how they, they handle the situation. I want to see if they can figure out, they might not, they might not know the answer, but I want to see if, if they have the confidence to go figure out how to find the answer. Because again, I don't want to micromanage much people. And I want people that can take ownership in their responsibility. So I'll, I'll create theoretical circumstances. Or maybe another example is, um, so earlier we talked about how I get a lot of traction on LinkedIn. What happened was it became unsustainable, but I didn't want to give it up because it was super valuable. The reason it became unsustainable is because I was spending one to two hours every morning. My first hour or two, every morning was on LinkedIn. And it was replying to comments on my post or going engaging in other people's posts to establish relationships. And so I had to figure out a way to scale that where I could kind of bow out a part of it, but also protect the integrity of the process because it was my written word and my voice and my comments. And so what I, what I did is I hired a person that took over a social media role and, and so I said, I'm going to kind of skip ahead a little bit. Um, when, when I finally hired them, I said, for the first 30 days, do nothing. I'm going to pay you to do nothing other than log in and look at how I engage. I want you to absorb my personality. I want you to understand how I engage with people. And so now this person's role is to help direct me where I should spend my time. And so now they know when they read so I still publish all my content on LinkedIn, but now they can go through and filter the comments on my posts and the comments in my private messages and go, Damon, go spend your time over here. And so now the first thing I do when I wake up, instead of spending an hour or two on LinkedIn, I spend 10 to 20 minutes clicking on the links that she Skyped me and she's eliminated all that other stuff for me. And so in that case, it's much more of, um, like you, ha you have to, you have to figure out a way that they can absorb this circumstance or the situation or communicate how they would act in that. And so that's how we, why we create the theoretical circumstances. So, um, you got to figure out a way to recreate the situation that allows them to showcase how good or bad they are within that circumstance. So if you're hiring, if you're hiring another one of that particular staff member, who's doing all of your socials, then what, you just give them a hypothetical, you'd ask them to go out into LinkedIn and find all the different uh, posts that they could potentially comment on and just give you examples of what they'll comment on your behalf? Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, I've had people in the past where um, I told them to go make me a spreadsheet of who they would engage with and why. And so then I can see um, if our mindsets align. Right. And, and so it's not that they gave a, a, a bad answer or anything, but I want to see if they get good answers because they all have justifiable reasons why they said you should engage with this person and talk about this type of topic, but it may not align with why I would go engage or not engage with somebody. So yeah, you just create uh, that's a good example of, of what I have done in creating that theoretical situation just to see how they are uh, naturally. Cause back to like what we were saying earlier, what do you like to do and what are you good at? I don't want to force somebody to write crappy comments that they don't agree with because then eventually they're going to get burned out on that and then it's going to look bad on me. So I try to align and put people in positions to maximize whatever their unique skill sets are or their personality is. Awesome. And as part of that hiring process, you just pay them a contract. You're like, here you go. This is probably a day's worth of work for you. Mm -hmm. And here's X amount of dollars which is probably above market rate. Exactly. Yeah. And I'll ask them in advance. I'll say, Hey, like, um, in that example of doing 
sample social media content, I'd say, Hey, why don't you go spend, um, you know, how long do you think it would take for you to do X, Y, and Z? And then they'll come back and say, ah, two hours. Okay, cool. And what's a fair rate? Well, I'm looking for between this and that. Okay, cool. So instead of two hours at 17 bucks, how about I pay you for four hours at 20 bucks? And then we'll see where it goes from there. Yeah. Amazing. Cool. So you've, you just went through your hiring process and you make sure that you're hiring the right people rather than uh, like you're preempting the issues that you have to usually rely on the manager or supervisor in order to do or mm -hmm. in order to, to facilitate those types of conversations and hiring and firing and all that kind of stuff. You got this amazing process for it, but now you've got a team of 60 with one of your staff doing more of the leadership soft skills. How do you, other than the systems that you've got in place that everyone knows what they need to do and you can see what tasks people are doing, how do you keep the culture and the team connection and make sure that people have really clear ownership as to what they need to do? That's a combination of the things we talked about with our cheerleader with a new title to be determined. You know, that's, that's mm -hmm. one of his main responsibilities is making sure the team's taken care of. And so we do, we do like, it's, it's really just the little things looking at people as humans instead of, um, numbers. And so even though I don't do as much follow up in, you know, how can we continue ongoing training for you to learn more skills about design or what are the latest tools, you know, now that other team member can take some of those responsibilities, but that doesn't mean I don't still chime in and go, Oh, Hey, you know, it's your birthday tomorrow. Happy birthday. And here's, here's an extra hundred bucks and I'll maybe go have dinner or something. Um, or Hey, it's your work anniversary. So I keep a log of those things that I can have personal touch points on. And, and a lot of the conversations that I have with the team member are not fake, right? I think a lot of, a lot of leaders misinterpret, that there, there's a lot to do. There's a lot of value in the touch points and, and having those non-business related discussions or at least brief comments. But I think some people make them too brief and it's like, Hey, how's your family doing? Okay, cool. So what about those reports? And then they just gloss right over it and you can tell there's no sincerity to it. So yeah. I have a lot of conversations that are not about business at all. And it's just checking in on how the family is doing. Um, you know, half my team's in the States and, and the other half is in the Philippines. So it's about coming like on, on the Filipino teams side of things, it's like coming to their side and understanding their working environments. And so they don't have a lot of things that we take for granted. So maybe like air conditioning and a lot of the units to, to buy air conditioning there are unrealistic. And so when I board some of the new team members overseas, like I've, I've become more familiar with, um, their working conditions and cultural things. And so then I'm sensitive to those. And so I go, some of the first questions I ask are, Hey, do you have like a good chair? Okay. So above and beyond your pay, I'm going to, here's, here's a hundred bucks to go get a new chair. Do you also have the air conditioning? The, the majority of the team members that I board don't have like a really good heating and air system. And so those are really simple things that I can do and I can come to from a humanity side and go, well, I don't want to work in a hot ass office. So why would anybody else? So why would I not invest Especially in the Philippines? Right? So yeah. Humidity. With the humidity and stuff. Yeah. So I try to find those little things to come at them um, from, from like a personal side and there's no catch to it either. Um, it's not like, you know, there's some team members where, um, they've asked for like, here's a perfect example. So one of my team members, she, the, the week that she started, her mom had a heart attack. And so she asked if she could have a salary advance. Um, and so that was my opportunity to show my trust and belief in the team. She had only been working on the team for, I don't know, three days, four days at the most. And so I sent her six weeks of pay in advance because she needed that to pay whatever hospital admittance to, to secure a spot for her mom in intensive care. Cause if she didn't get the deposit on that, then she'd still be at the hospital, but she wouldn't be getting the level of care that she needed. So it's like, 
you know, do I get anything, do I get anything immediate on the front side of paying out salary in advance? No, but I guarantee you she's never going to quit now. And I guarantee you she's going to work a lot harder for me than she would have worked for somebody else because I was able to support her on, on the human level. And so there's a lot of things like that. Um, you know, when the pandemic hit, a lot of people, I realized that was an opportunity to, um, look, I've, I've never met. So my, I got 60 team members. I met six of them in person and I would oh, put like them physically in person, right? Physically you've had, person, you've had yeah. plenty of video conferences with them and stuff. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We talk yeah. all the time yeah, on Skype and zoom, but yeah, six in person and I would put their loyalty up against anybody. And that's because of those little things that I do. Like earlier I said, maybe we'll talk about some of the funny things that have come from this. Um, like one example is I've been asked to be a godfather twice for people that I've never met in person. Um, one of the team members that I have met, but this was before I met them in person. Um, they were in the Philippines and they invited me to their wedding. And so it was actually two of my team members were getting married. And, um, but at the time of their wedding, my wife was in her third trimester with her daughter. And so I didn't feel comfortable going to the other side of the world and leaving her hanging in her third trimester. So I said, I would totally be there if it was any other circumstance, but I can't make it. And you know what they did is they went and got a life size cardboard cut out of me. There's, I have pictures of a <laughs> six foot tall Damon towering over five foot three Filipinos and in a, in a life size cardboard cutout in their wedding pictures, like actually in their wedding pr process and their line and everything. And so like, it's, it's, it's such a funny story to share because it's so interesting and unique. But like, if you look past the funny sides, that says a lot about the emotional relationship for somebody to be willing to do that. Um, so I just, I always look for those opportunities to, to just be like, Hey, like, you know, we, there, there's more to this than just the paycheck. And I appreciate you beyond just what you contribute, um, to the company's bottom line. And, and then sure, like, you know, that part of that's always just been my nature, but then when you realize you can use it intentionally, then yes, of course there's company benefits, but it also amplifies the people that you work with. And then they realize that there's, um, there's long-term opportunity for them to stay with you. And so then they grow as individuals too. And then that facilitates the opportunity for them to grow into those leadership roles and things like that. So as the, as, as the team cheerleader, now I need to figure out a freaking title yeah, for him. Champion maybe. <laughs> yeah. Team, team champion. champion. Um, he just sent me a message two days ago saying that um, how much he appreciates his new role and how he feels um, you know, that he's contributing in a greater capacity and there's something that touches him inside by being able to touch the team members inside. And he said that there's something that he, you know, I, I can't remember the exact words he used, but he said something like, um, I've never, I've never had this type of emotional feeling of pride that I have when I talk to the team and they talk about all the opportunities that you've given them. That's something special that you've created, Damon. And so what I wrote back to him is I said, you know, that makes me even more confident in the role that we created for you then, because I made the right move to try and protect that stuff. So it's, it's, um, what's, what's been most amazing about kind of protecting others and having interest in the team is like the non work stuff, like, like the Godfather thing and the wedding thing. Like those are things that, uh, you can't really put a price on. So what, what do you feel are all the, all the factors that lead to that? Cause that's an incredible team culture or at least a, it's incredible leadership culture. I think what's it's contributed trust. to it? I think it's just trust. Um, and what's contributed to that trust? Oh, I don't know. Um, pro probably a lot of little things. One is it's like, I don't, I don't want to work in a toxic relationship. I don't want to create and foster a toxic relationship, um, working environment where I have to babysit people. And so I think it's part, I think it's a combination of a lot of things we talked about, right? Mental bandwidth. I just don't want that environment. I, I would rather pay somebody more or take longer to hire and find the right person that I don't have to micromanage. And then I can just let them own those roles. And so part of it is, I think it's a combination of just what feels right, but also protecting my own interests and not wanting to babysit and not wanting to micromanage. And then micromanaging is not productive. Like you hire these people for a reason 
So why don't you let them do the thing that you hired them for? Yeah. Make, makes perfect sense. And then there are all those small touch points that you have throughout. Like you wouldn't become someone's child's godfather unless you were always asking about their family and you felt, or they felt that you were connected to their family. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's things like those questions, like that comment you just made are things that I don't think about um, proactively. Like you saying those things Mm -hmm. are more reactive. I'm like, Oh yeah, I guess you're right. Um, Because they send me, like they send me videos of their kids. Like, Hey, here's what he's doing today, Damon, you know? And then, um, so the, the life size cardboard cutout has a name and he lives on his name's cardboard Damon. And so, um, they send me updates of cardboard Damon in the garden and cardboard Damon recently joined a band and plays guitar. (laughs) So it, it, it becomes this thing where we support each other personally right we we engage each other and have conversations outside of work that's beautiful and so that that makes it much clearer as to how you've gone from 15 to 60 in such a short period of time and you've still got a lot of confidence as to the fact that the business will keep going and be even better than it was before yeah um i i'm super interested to see where where the next year brings us because there's there's been a little bit of learning curve on my part on, on the leadership thing. Not, not so much of what I know I need of what roles I need to pe- put people in, but it's just making sure that you protect those things that, that we've talked about. And so now that we're kind of getting all those, those gaps filled and those people in the final positions, I'm really eager to kind of, you know, flip the switch and see where it goes. Yeah. Because you might like, so, so much of your leadership style is based on being able to be connected with your team. Uh, literally have a cardboard daemon around uh, or know their kids' names and be able to be able to communicate them re- with, with them really effectively and beautifully and about everything in their own personal life and surgeries and their mums being unwell and all of that. And if you're even from 15 to 60, makes that a whole lot harder. But to go from like 60 to 120 or to 1,000, there's no way that <laughs> yeah. can be maintained, right? I know. Yeah. That's, that's, that's probably the next phase is, is I think my phases are going to go a lot lot quicker here in the years to come because it's kind of been like, I'd probably average around four year phases. And I think they're going to be closer to like 18 month phases in in the next few cycles. Um, Just because like I said, there's no reason not to shoot for the moon at this point. Um, There's one other thing I want to take a step back on that I, that I want to touch on that I kind of forgot to come back to is when I started talking about, um, godfather thing and the wedding thing and, and those opportunities to communicate to your team member and, and establish relationships is like when COVID hit, that was another great opportunity for me to reaffirm to the team, my commitment in them, which then in turn, um, creates a commitment back to the company is understandably a lot of people are losing their jobs when COVID started happening. And so that was an opportunity for me to go to the team and say, Hey, look, your jobs are secure. And just the amount of stress that must have alleviated for, I don't know who or how many, but I imagine some of them, that was a big concern. And so by giving them that peace of mind and that comfort allows them to be more effective in what they do and work. And then also personally, they can be, you know, a better parent because they're not stressed about how they're going to pay for things, which then makes them a better employee as well. And there's all these little opportunities where I try to see how I can help encourage them to be a better person, not by my definition and standards, but by their own. So like I have one team member who, um, he used to not, he, he was terrified of swimming. And so a couple of years ago, it sounds so silly. Some of these, I don't realize how silly they are until I start, until I start verbalizing them. Um, he wanted a kiddie pool. Obviously you can't swim in a kiddie pool, but that mattered enough to him to feel comfortable just sitting in the water. So I bought, so he, he would send me pictures years ago of, of, I mean, he, he was a, he's a healthy, he's a healthy guy, muscle guy, and just this big dude, just sitting in this tiny kiddie pool, you know, and he's got his, he's goofing around. He's got his goggles on, like what's he doing with the goggles? But, um, now he crushes it. He's an amazing swimmer now. Like he even goes and does competitions now because that was something that was really powerful to him to overcome that fear. And now he owns it. And now it's a really special part of him. And then like uh, back to like the COVID thing, um, I was, I was really concerned with, with, you know, mental stability, 
not for any specific reason, just for the obvious that being stuck in your house sucks. And then depending on different team members in different areas of the world, they have more or less strict lockdowns. They have more or less um, conveniences than other places. Some people have yards. They can at least get out and enjoy the sunlight. Others don't. And so that was like a big concern of mine is how do I protect my team's well-being? And so I said, hey, look, um, what can I contribute that has nothing to do with work that would just help your stability? So one of the team members wanted a weight set. And so I forwarded them the money to order money to do uh, to order the supplies to do weights in their house because they couldn't go to the gym anymore um i ended up buying whatever the biggest netflix plan there is that i can share with you know 50 people <laughs> not, not 50 people but like you know for the for the filipino team that was like a luxury for them and so i i, I bought the 20 30 dollar month whatever family plan and gave it all to them to use. So multiple people can use it at the same time. And that, like, I couldn't tell you how many thank yous I got like two, three weeks later. I I started saving these little screenshots of the messages they would send. And um, it was, it was just countless messages, like one a day, sometimes two a day for like a week or two. Uh, Some of them appreciated, like some of the team members that are single and live by themselves appreciated it for, um, you know, that kind of mental companionship uh, outside of work, something that, that they could do. And then uh, a big chunk of them that had kids, it, they thanked me on behalf of their kids. And it was like, you know, we can't go out of the house. Kids can't go out of the house at our location. There's absolutely literally nothing we can do other than go crazy in this house. And then now we have this whole library of content and documentaries and educational materials and cartoons and fun things and so COVID was a really unique opportunity for me that um, I was able to further cement um, a lot of relationships and loyalty. Is that style of leadership something you bring into all areas of your life? Mm, that's a good question. Um, yes and no. <laughs> so I think that I have that intent in the majority of the other areas in my life, but I think the intent can be interpreted different. You know, a good example might be family and friends. Um, I am like, I try to be sensitive to how things can be interpreted to the other person. Um, but I also have very little empathy for excuses. And so when I try to balance that, it's like, you know, I might have friends and family that are stuck at a point in their life. And to me, the, the answer is very clear and it's right in front of them. And so I will tell it to them and there's nothing rude in what I'm saying, but it's honest, but it can be interpreted as rude on the other side. Um, mm. So I think that some people, th- there are definitely circumstances where it might take a couple conversations with me to understand my intent. It might be misinterpreted. Um, so yeah, I think I have the right idea in most places, um, but, but my lack of, sympathy for excuses um, could probably be misinterpreted some ways uh, the wrong way because I want nothing but good for the person. And in my mind, it's like, here's the answer to your problem. And in their mind, it's Damon's a dick. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you can, you can choose your friends, right? You can't, you can't choose your family, but you can, you can choose the, the the majority of people you spend your time with. And is that kind of just the way that you, that you limit the number of, uh, that you control. I forgot the word. I'm missing the word. But is that, is that the way that you choose the people that you spend most time with as friends and peers? Is by just saying, can you, can you accept that I've got some feedback for you? Are you going to see it as no. Damon's a dick or Damon's helpful? No, not at all. I'm not, I'm not proactively vocal in recommendations. Um, so that's what makes it tricky is, I only give feedback and recommendations on opportunities to solve problems in life or whatever it is. Um, you know, I get a lot of people that come to me and, and will ask questions, whether it's about business or I'm very, you know, I showcase, like we talked a lot about my appreciation for, um, balancing family and work and my appreciation for my wife and kids and things like that. So a lot of people come to me and will send me private messages about their, relationship or circumstance and ask my opinion on things like that. Um, and, and family get togethers. Sometimes people will ask me, what's my opinion on 
whatever, you know, stocks and this and that. And I'm, I'm very hesitant to give advice. Not that I don't, not that, not that I, I don't mind talking about those things. And I definitely want to help people, but the majority of the people, because they make excuses or have a victim mindset, um, they don't take action on it. And that frustrates me. Not, not that they don't take action, but they don't take action on, on the advice that they asked for. And so I don't give advice. Very rarely do I give advice or make commentary on personal things unless somebody blatantly asks me for it. And, and so, no, I don't, I don't choose friends and this and that based on how they can take feedback because I'm actually um, pretty intentional about avoiding unnecessary feedback. But, but if you ask me for something and, and I know that I can help you and I know that there's something you can take action on, that's the part where um, I kind of lose interest in the relationship is, is when you don't accept responsibility for the things that you can control. And then worse, when you have an opportunity to fix those things that you can control. So how do you choose the people you spend most time with? I don't, I don't know. That's a, that's an interesting, um, that, that's a big part of my life right now, right? Is, um, they, they tell, they say it's lonely at the top kind of thing. And there's some truth to that. Um, so I most, the, the people that I find myself most attracted to, to spend my time outside of work are people that are comfortable in their own skin. Um, I don't, I don't have to surround myself by other entrepreneurs. I don't have to surround myself by successful people. I just want to surround myself by happy people. And, um, and, and that kind of layers into the, the part that's frustrating with the question before is there's the, the path to happiness is usually right in front of you. Right. But it's just, are you going to take action to get there or not? And that's the part that frustrates me is, is people's inability to, get uncomfortable to solve their problems. Instead, they just like kick the can down the road and deal with these things forever, which I can't wrap my head around. So, um, it, it's, as I get older, it's been something that I've, I've identified that I have to be, I, even though I'm not naturally sympathetic to excuses, I don't think I'll ever be sympathetic to excuses, but I, I've had to try to be more sympathetic to interpreting the circumstances of why the excuses exist. And then, understanding maybe a timeline of how people can get out of those circumstances and then maybe figuring out, um, how I can support them in their, in their own environment. Um, I don't know. It, it's definitely kind of a, a thing that's top of mind, uh, at this current cycle of my life. Yeah. It, it's a, it's such a cool topic. Uh, and I'd have a million more questions about it, but I'm mindful of our time. And so it's, I'd just still love to ask you about, uh, kind of the, how you present yourself in, at home, in your marriage and with your kids. And maybe if we start along the same lines, you mm. you get frustrated when you give advice to someone and they don't take ownership of it and they don't commit and you got three kids. How does that work out? <laughs> so very valid question. Um, totally different circumstances for me. Um, I could see how they could be interpreted as being similar, but totally different for me. Um, yes. So kind of like we talked earlier about learning from what other people's other people did wrong. Um, so I grew up in, like I said, my parents got divorced when I was two. Um, then my mom remarried a second gentleman. He, he was pretty chill. Um, but the third guy, he was an alcoholic. They were married for 20 something years, very toxic environment. And so from that, I learned how not to raise a family. And so it's like, those are the things I don't want to expose my kids to on a consistent basis of those toxic things. And that's why I, I bought the, the house to grow into to provide that stability. Cause those are all the things that when I was a kid, I didn't know any different and, and I don't have like this traumatic childhood. Well, my childhood was interesting because to me, it wasn't traumatic to, to, it, I learned from it. And I think it's like, there's, there's, there's like a cliche story where it's something like there was a, uh, there was a two brothers and one was an alcoholic and homeless and the other was successful. And, and somebody went to the first brother and said, why are you an alcoholic? And his, and his response is, well, because my father was an alcoholic. And then they went to the successful gentleman and they said, why are you successful? He says, well, because my father was an alcoholic. And, and that's very applicable to me because I learned from that, the toxic environment of, the alcoholic stepfather. And then I learned from the victim mindset that my, that my mom had and n never like never f 
looking for a path out of that, you know? And so for me, it was like, okay, those are the things that I don't want. I, I, I don't want to move two, three times a year for my kids. Um, I don't want financial instability. And so those are all the things that now I, I take, I'm very intentional by now, hopefully like intention is very clear with me. Right. And so in all capacities of my life, be intentional with the direction of the company, be intentional with the opportunities I want to give my kids, uh, be intentional for giving them a better childhood than I had, but without turning them into spoiled shitheads. And so it's like, how do I find all those balances of everything? And, it, and it's just all about, um, so it's all, it's all intentional. And so because of that, I can separate the circumstances of like the example you gave of how do you tell somebody something and they, and they don't take action on it versus how do you tell a 10 year old and they don't take action on it? So, you know, certainly in the back of my mind, it's like, ah, oh, come on, just do it. But, but then right aside with that is well, he's a 10 year old. So let him be a 10 year old. So how do you present it? Like, how do you find that balance that you're referring to? Um, I, I don't push my, I try to find the balance of, um, encouraging independence without pushing my, my, ex, my, my excessive intention. Like, you know, I, I'm very intentional and strategic about things and I understand the value and the benefits of that, but I also understand the weaknesses and the OCD and, you know, the constant thoughts and things like that. And so I try to, I try to, um, show all the positive opportunities and characteristics from the things that I've learned while just exposing them to it, not requiring it of them, but exposing them to things like maybe an easier way to explain it is just like sports. So I don't require my kids to do any sports, but I expose them to all of them. So they, at least for a season, they all play basketball. They all play baseball. Um, they, you know, play soccer. And then if they don't like it, they have to at least try it. But if they don't like it, then that's totally fine. You know, my one kid, my 10 year old, he tried wrestling. He went like three times and he's like, this is definitely not for me. That's fine. You know, I don't want my kids to have to live through, like, I think a lot of parents force their kids to, they try to live their dreams through their kids. And I don't try to force my kids to do anything. I, I just want them to be happy and confident in whatever it is that they do. And so I try to expose them to all these different things so they can hopefully find you know, we talked about dating things and marrying things. I want to, I want to, I'm fortunate enough that I want to try to expose them to different opportunities so they can find the things that they like and don't like to date. So that ultimately they can find their own path in life. I don't want to push them down a path, but I want to help them find it on their own. So do you push them to try things? Um, I expose them to things. And if, if I know it's not a definite no, then I'll try to encourage them to at least try it one time. Yeah. I mean, there's some things that are just clearly obvious. Like my kids have zero interest in football. Um, not, you know, American football, um, but they absolutely love soccer. And so the, there's certain opportunities that are no brainers. Um, my, my 10 year old is super active and he's like at a level 10 energy until the last blink of an eye at night. And then my seven-year-old is the total opposite. He's the most innocent, soft-hearted kid you'll ever meet. And when it's 8.30, he'll tell you I'm tired and I want to go lay down. Meanwhile, his brother's wanting to stay up until 2 o'clock in the morning, even though he can barely keep his eyes open. So it's like they're all different. And then, you know, my daughter's four, and so she's kind of a, depending on the day, she's kind of a mix between the two of them. And so I, they're all separate human beings. And so... I don't force them all to try all the same things, but I try to identify what their strengths are and the things that make them happy and then expose them to the things that I think that can continue that path to happiness. And how about, uh, how about alignment with your wife and raising the kids? Like I'm sure you guys already have a lot of value alignment, but there are always, uh, there are always disagreements in how you handle your kids or what you encourage them to do or push them to do or, how you communicate with them or what boundaries you set. Yeah, we've been pretty uh, lucky. Um, I think the biggest differences uh, that we've had to align on are the differences in our childhood. Like we both grew up kind of lower middle class. And so we have that appreciation for the opportunities that we can give our kids. Um, but I think the biggest differences have been in me being more proactive and understanding 
what is normal and not normal in a childhood and how to not apply that or apply that to our childhood. So like, like I said, with my childhood at the time, I didn't think anything different. Like when, when you're a kid and you're raised in whatever environment you're raised in, you don't know any different, but looking back or even as a teenager, I was able to go, that's not normal. Or, or maybe it is, maybe, maybe it's common, but common doesn't mean it should be acceptable or normal, right? Toxic alcoholic stepfather environments. Like that's probably common, but it shouldn't be normal. And so there's like things like that, um, not on the alcoholic side, but there's like things like little things that we were probably both raised in those similar circumstances, but I identified it and, and said that shouldn't be that way. And so there's some things like that. Next, you're going to ask me for an example. And now I don't have one, but there's, there's things like that where, where I might, I might be like, okay, I know that that's how the thing that's how the way the things are. And that's how other people do it. And that's how we were raised in it, in it. But why, why should we do things that way? Like that doesn't make sense. We could do it this better way or this more impactful way or this more encouraging way, or just eliminate it entirely. So it hasn't been so much disagreements on, um, like how, how do we approach our kids and, and encourage them to do certain things? It's just like little things like just because it's been done that way, doesn't mean we have to do it that way. And, and then, and then it's been more of a self-discovery thing for my wife where she's like, Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. And so I think probably more of the way that we parent our kids is, has probably been more of a learning curve for my wife and her own self-discovery process than it has been in how we translate those things to, to the kids. Yeah. Look, I won't ask you more questions about your, about your family and relationships. Cause I know you're, you're private in that regard as well, at least in an open forum. Uh, but I, what I you... am totally an open book. I'm just not going to tell you my kids' names. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's how uh, it works. But... I'll tell you everything about my family. I'm just not going to tell you anything identifiable. All right. Perfect. Then, then I do have another question on that. Because clearly you're you're attempting to encourage them to grow in the ways that are going to be best for each of them. And you've already, you've already shared that they all have different personalities, they have different tendencies, different behaviors, uh, different passions, different joys, different interests. Mm-hmm. Something I'm wrestling with uh, in my own mindset with my two year old daughter, and with a lot of my to give context with a lot of my clients, I do personality typing, for example. Mm-hmm and then coaching off the back of personality typing. Mm. And a big part of it is to leverage your strengths, but also to work on your weaknesses. Mm-hmm. And so there's this one particular trait within my daughter, which is just so blatantly obvious, um, is that she she doesn't like too much of the new. She'll always, mm. she'll always resist new stuff. Like she'll want to read the same book, not just multiple times over and over again, but she'll want to read the same book multiple times over and over again every single night. Yeah. It's like, well, that, that's great. That's your superpower. You can focus on one thing and you can just stay dedicated to one thing. That's awesome. But you're not going to get that far in life if that's all you do and if you're just neglecting everything else. And so put a rule in place, which is saying, no, we only read a book once and once per night. And we'll also encourage her to actively find a different book. If she takes one out, it's like, oh, you really want to read that one? But we read that one last night. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, uh, okay. She puts it away and then takes another book. I'm like, oh. <laughs> and so I'm hoping that all these little things are going to encourage her to become uh, stronger, better, more, more well-rounded, more balanced. Do you have any similar types of strategies that you're applying with your kids as they're growing up? Um, yeah. So I would actually take a hybrid approach to what you do. So part of, part of what you said is, is, you know, you encourage them to explore other books, which I would do too. The other part that I would do the total opposite of you. Um, and I'm not saying I'm right and you're wrong, but I, I would not, I, I wouldn't care if my kid wanted to read the same book over and over and over. Cause what I've realized is kids go through cycles and phases. And so by allowing them to get it out of their system, then it, be, it makes them, um, more, open and embrace the next thing because they've completely exhausted the other thing. And so like a good example is my 10 year old. Um, he really, he started to play the video game Fortnite like a year and a half ago and uh, now probably about two years ago. And it was just like this constant thing, but it made him happy. And so it's not my thing, but that doesn't matter because it's his thing. And so there are certainly the nights where I was in your position where it's like, Fortnite again, you know, the same book again. Do you know how many times I've watched the movie Home Alone? It's like every, <laughs> it's like every damn night. And like, and, and I'm not even joking. I bet you we watch Home Alone 200 times a year. 
Wow. At least and, there are five of them, right? Or four or five of them, whatever it is. What? You just watch the one. Oh, no, it's just the first two because the third one <laughs> sucks. And, and, and there's no fourth one. Well, they just came out with another one called Home Sweet Home Alone. It is not even close. It's like, right. it's not even like it's, it's, they just ruined the franchise. With that. Yeah. So, but no, so like, so, so back to the Fortnite thing is, um, it became annoying and where it's like, why is he playing the same thing over and over and over and over and over? But I, I, a couple things crossed my mind is like, I remember when, you know, when I was a kid and, and it was like, Oh, when gaming systems first came out and then it was like, well, you're going to turn into a zombie by playing the game all the time. Right. And then of course, nobody as an adult is a zombie nowadays. And then you go back to even before that, when the TV came out, well, quit turn at TV all day. You're, it's going to fry your mind. Well, it didn't fry anybody's mind. And then you go before that and it's like, quit listening to the radio all day. It's going to ruin your brain. Well, it didn't ruin anybody's brain. So then like, I was kind of thinking about that. And so I, I took a step back and I said, well, it's annoying to me, but is it really doing any harm? And so let it run its cycle. And it was like a two year cycle. And now he plays Fortnite hardly ever. And, and you know, what's been, what's been cool about it is, um, he can now, he can now see the before and after. And you know what he says now is now he says, Oh, my, my friend, he, he always plays Minecraft. He never, he never goes outside. He never wants to do anything with us other than play Minecraft. And so now he can see the different worlds. He can see the different world of being immersed in it versus the value of what other opportunities are outside of it. And so there's benefits to both, right? Especially like during COVID, like that's, that was his social mechanism is he could converse with his friends through, through games, especially during the first like three to six months where, where everything just got locked down. And so for me, I, I've, I've, started to take a different intentional approach is to let them get it out of their cycle. That there's a reason, there's usually a reason why they're wanting to do that same thing over and over and over and over and over. And we may never know what that reason is, but, and again, I'm not saying that I'm right, but for me, every time I've let them burn through that cycle, it's always had some positive thing at the end of it. Mm. I'll, I'll, I'll take that in. I mean, there's, there's a lot which, which I'm doing with my daughter, which is just to show she loves, if she's doing something which I believe is going to be great for her and she's addicted to it. Awesome. You want to keep drawing? Yeah. Keep drawing. Yeah. Awesome. Um, she's, she's becoming addicted to screens. She's never had screen time, but you walk mm. through, you walk through a shopping center and there are these big plasma screens. It's just like, yeah, <laughs> just completely stationary the whole time. Just watching it. It's like, hang on, come on, keep moving along. Yeah. But I don't want her to be like one of those, like the, I look around the shopping center and the only kids that aren't looking at those, at those big ads on the big screens are the ones who have a screen right in front of them, just staring mm -hmm. at their own screen. And so I don't Sorry. want her to be like that either. So I'm like, well, sure, we can do screen time, but we're not going to do screen time where you're watching TV. We're going to do screen time where you're drawing or solving puzzles or being creative. Yeah. Rather than, rather than doing something where you're just being entertained because it just makes it easier for me. It's hard. Yeah. I don't think there's a right answer. Um, because every kid's attention is different. Every kid's interests are different. Every parent is different. And I've certainly gone through the struggles and we continue to go through struggles of how much screen time is appropriate and what context on the screen time is appropriate. Um, I don't think there's a right answer. And then, and then when you find your right answer, the answer is going to change. Um, but but then also to the other side of it, I, one thing that you, you want to be sensitive on the other side is the more you limit something from somebody, the more they want it. So you, mm -hmm. you also have to figure out how to expose them to the thing so that they don't because you, you may, you may delay their addiction now, but you amplify their addiction later. And so it's like all the things that um, you're told you can't have are the things you want the most. Right. Yes. And so you don't want to completely exclude it. And so you got, you have to figure out what the right balance is. And I think the balance will vary for everybody. Yeah. Well, that's some wise words. I'm, I'm going to take that in for myself. So oh, maybe, maybe another question I'll ask you before I start the wrap up is what type of advice would you have given to your younger self or what type of decisions do you wish you had done differently or made differently? I'm a freaking unicorn. Um, I've, I've had this question before and I wouldn't change anything. Um, because every, everything I've 
gone through has, has been pretty intentional and got me to the places that I want. And even the things that weren't intentional, I've learned from, you know, obviously nobody wants to be raised with an alcoholic stepfather, but, um, it, it, it's all, it's all what you, what you make of your circumstances. And so it's, a lot of us have been in really bad circumstances and a lot of people have been in circumstances infinitely worse than I've been in, but, but you have to try and figure out a way to go, okay, well, it's not my fault that I'm in this, in this circumstance, but it is my fault if I don't get out of it. So for me, all the things that I went through that weren't ideal as a, as a kid, um, had a massive unintentional, maybe in some capacities unintentional, but then uh, when I could identify it, it was very intentional and they've all had a positive outcome. So it's like, it is whatever you can make of it. And so I, I chose to to be intentional in making positives out of, out of everything that I had gone through. So I don't really have anything that I look back and sure in the moment it sucked, but I can tie it directly to something else that benefited me later. Incredible. I love it because almost everyone who I'm speaking to now in terms of trying to identify success, I'm speaking to the most successful people I can find, uh, are sharing something quite similar. Well, it hasn't been, there hasn't been any massive mistakes I've made. Like there have been things which I've done, which I wish I had done differently, but I don't regret having done it that way. Yeah. And to other people, they may have been massive mistakes. I mean, the thing that one person thinks wasn't a massive mistake probably the exact same thing to some another person would be a massive mistake. Um, it's probably just the interpretation. Uh, it, it's the same mistake, but one person just goes, Oh yeah, well, well, cool. Now I learned this thing and I can do it better now. And so then they just move on and forget about it. And that's why it doesn't seem like a big deal to them. Yeah. Look, you've, you've shared so much in this conversation and I just want to try and, uh, wrap my head around, uh, the core messages which you've shared. And so, uh, after this, I'll, I'll let you, I'll, I'll be asking you if there's anything which you want to adjust or add or, or correct, but there's a big part of what you've done in your life is all about, uh, taking action. You said, try, we looked at commit, but it's ultimately you're, you're saying, this is something that I'm choosing to do. I'm going to put in the effort. I'm going to make it happen. And so then you go through this whole process of building your team and then making sure you've got all the systems and processes and everything you're doing is based on. Uh, the most incredible outcome you can provide for your clients and for everyone you connect with. And then that just made it so easy to go into social proof. And then that was taking too long. And so you systemize that as well. And so everything which you've done, though, everything is based on living life in line with your values. All of it. You're protecting, even when you're talking about protecting your mental bandwidth, you're talking about that to be able to continue to live life in line with your values. You don't want work to take up too much time. You miss out time with your kids. And that's one of your values. You don't want to be stuck doing kind of menial tasks. You want to be able to uh, be able to build beyond where you are and to be able to scale so that you can continue to live life in line with your values. And you're so it's taking you so long to take someone on a cheerleader, champion, leadership role, whatever we call it. You're gonna, I'm looking forward to hearing what you change <laughs> cheerleader to. And you've you've taken so long to get there because you hold supporting others and leading others with such a high value that you struggle to kind of let it go. And then when you're letting it go, you're, it's not so much you're just letting it go, you're passing it on to someone else who you're trusting is going to do it even better. Mm -hmm. And so that was a really powerful question which you mentioned on what are you good at doing versus what do you like to do? And it sounds like you asked that question to almost everyone who's looking up to you for advice. For sure. But great, you're good at doing that. What do you actually like to do? And then you said, you said two pretty powerful things. Uh, one was, uh, it's not tra nothing's traumatic if you learn from it. I loved it when you shared that. And then secondly, just more recently, like I don't know, a minute ago, you said, if it's not my fault that I'm in these circumstances, but it is my fault if I don't get out of it, which means you're taking personal responsibility for everything in your life. And it means that you're avoiding all the regret and the negative emotions which could possibly come from it. Uh, that that's that's my that's my attempt at summarizing the high level of what you shared today and the key patterns: taking yeah. ownership and taking leadership and taking responsibility for everything in your life. Yeah, I think you nailed it. Um, I don't I don't 
I don't realize a lot of those things, like I said, proactively, it's more reactively as you put, as you verbalize them. Um, for, for me, it's, it's a lot more simplistic than that. So yes, you're right on all of those, but for me, all of those just fall into the bucket of what could I do to just to be happy. Right. And I certainly have my days. I feel like I'm more stressed now than ever. Right. With, with the scaling because, but it's all good problems. Like I don't have it. Like if I were to look on paper and be like, Oh, business doubled and I have a bunch of team members and like all this thing, like, what am I going to complain about? Right. But it doesn't mean it's not stressful. And so for me, it's, it's like, how do I, how do I protect that happiness or what short-term sacrifices can I make for long-term benefits? Like I'm all about, delayed gratification. So earlier we talked about documenting processes and I talked about how bad it sucked, but now I get to reap the rewards of that delayed gratification. So it's like the same thing with, um, you know, the team cheerleader where it's like, that was painful by having to, to not be able to address some of those things and running thin on Damon time, but it was the right decision to have that delayed gratification to find the right person to protect that and pass those responsibilities on. So for me, it's really just like happiness. Um, and I don't think I've found total happiness. I think there's a lot of areas that I can improve on, but I'm, I'm intentional in figuring out the solutions to what those are. So yes, you are correct on all the check boxes, but for me, it's just like, will this make me happy now or will it contribute to happiness later? I've, uh, it's very a yes, no black, white kind of thing for me. Like, is this worth a long-term investment or is there immediate benefits? Cause if not, like, why am I even thinking about it? So to anyone listening uh, and maybe, maybe they've got a question that's coming up in their mind. It's like, well, you always got to do things which you don't want to do in order to get a better benefit later. But if you're trying to live life just in line with being happier, then isn't, always delaying or very often delaying gratification means you're doing things which absolutely suck and then you're not able to really live a happy life right now because you're always delaying the gratification what would your response be to them yeah there's certainly part of that um you know i don't like let's go back to the beginning years of of starting my company i didn't like working 16 to 20 hour days and have anybody making me do it but I could understand the value in doing it. So for me, it was like, okay, what is more valuable now living my life day to day and being, you know, quote unquote happy then by not working 16 to 20 hour days, or is it better for me to invest the time? So then I can work whenever I want and have podcasts with Harry and then go to my kid's basketball game after the podcast, because now I have freedom of time. So like you can, it's, it's which, happiness matters more. And so for, so it's not about being unhappy. It's about, um, continuing to steer the ship in the direction towards ultimate happiness. And along that comes sacrifices. So what are you going to do? Like you can't have both. Right. And so, I mean, I guess sometimes you could, but there's no way now I'd go, Oh man, that would have been so nice to just work like four hour days, 15 years ago. And then I'm sitting in my little studio apartment with all my kids crammed in here. And you know, now I'm, so maybe it's not about happiness then, but it's avoiding misery later. You know, maybe we'll look at it that way. I don't know. Well, you, you said it, I, I heard it really well when you said it's, uh, what's the value in this and what value, uh, how valuable is this to me? which comes back to what I kept hearing you share is that you're living life in line with your values, which doesn't just necessarily mean in terms of what's going to make you happy or what you like right now, but what you're going to value in the long term, what has more importance, what's more, what's more permanent, nothing's permanent, but what's more permanent, what's more long lasting. And it seems like you're making your decisions that way. Yeah. It's everything's uh, directed towards better circumstances. So either bettering me as an individual, bettering opportunities for my kids, bettering opportunities for my family, bettering opportunities for my team. Um, I don't, I don't have a problem making hard decisions. I, I, I'm trying to remember one way I said it recently. Um, it, it was something along the lines of making easy choices is easy. Making hard choices is right. Right. And so that's kind of how I look at it is what's the right choice, not the easy choice. And on that note, we're going to finish this. So thank, thank you so much for being part of this conversation. I'm, I'm certain that every listener or at least the vast majority will get so much value from this conversation and will really be able to revel in the wisdom. Uh, if people want to reach out to you, how are they able to find you? 
yeah, thanks for the opportunity to chat. Um, you know, these are the, these are the, the fun conversations that I, I tend to enjoy. Um, it's always fun talking about business and stuff like that, but when you get on a deeper level, the, the, the conversations always mean a little bit, a little bit more. Um, yeah. So LinkedIn, we talked about Damon Burton. You can find me on there. I'm pretty active on Facebook as well. And if you want to learn more about what I do, you can go to free com. There's my story in there about how I started the agency, how I scaled it. And if you really want to geek out and actually get into marketing, then it's a blueprint on how to do marketing too. But I actually like the first two chapters the best because it's more on that personal side. And, um, the, there's a chapter in there that's really relevant to our conversations today. It's called the, the title is called be human. And it talks about a lot of things that we covered, um, cardboard Damon and the wedding. You know, there's pictures of him in there if you want to see him. And, and, um, <laughs> there's, um, you know, uh, examples of, we talked about the 150 grand that was added in contracts and have pictures of what conversations led to what contracts and what dollar amounts. So it's a pretty cool thing where you can learn more about me, but also learn more about if you want to take it from a business perspective, there's a lot of business advice in there as well. It's amazing. Always adding value. I love it, Damon. Well, I appreciate the conversation, Harry. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Success with Purpose. And I also hope that you feel capable to apply some of the perspectives and learnings from this episode in your own life. If you enjoyed this conversation, be sure to like and subscribe below. And until next time, live with purpose.